My friends, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My message today is a a tale about investments, the way God has invested into our lives and shown us mercy and asks that we invest in other people and show them mercy as well. In all three of the Gospels, which share the same point of view, which is, by the way, what synoptic means, um, there comes a moment when Jesus tells his disciples that it's time for him to leave behind his public ministry and to go to Jerusalem, the capital city, where he is going to be tortured and killed. And he repeats this uh, to his friends on a couple of different occasions so that they know what's coming. And he also says that this is going to be the fulfillment of his revealing God's intended rule and reign on the earth. Here's the way Dr. Luke tells that story in his gospel of Jesus' move towards Jerusalem. This is Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 56. When the days draw near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go toward Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them and they went on to another village. I wanted to read that scene because it immediately precedes one of Jesus' most important parables. Pastor Art Barrett, my friend and I, have been working our way through many of Jesus' parables these last few months, specifically looking at the ways in which Jesus teaches how God invests in us and expects that we will be investing in other people. As Jesus says very succinctly, just in a couple of more chapters, Luke 12, 48, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. It goes without saying that this is a high challenge statement. Jesus is always calibrating an invitation to a relationship with the living God. And then once we have responded to that invitation, recognizing that he has placed on us the high challenge to be his chosen representatives in our everyday lives. This is why we see the almost constant refrain when Jesus is teaching parables, let the one who has ears to hear listen. Jesus knows this is challenging material, and he knows that not everyone is always in a place or ready to receive what it is he's teaching at that moment. Thankfully, God is loving and patient and merciful and slow to anger. And so one of the reasons it seems to me we are often repeating these challenging words to those of us uh, who are trying to listen to what God is saying to us is because it takes a while sometimes for this to finally get into the center of our beings and become part of who we are. And that's what I want to encourage you towards today. The immediate scene of our text today is an expert in the law. Uh, This is actually the Jewish Torah that comes to challenge Jesus with a probing question. Luke says he was asking this question to drill down on what it is he's hearing Jesus teach. We should not assume that this was a hostile question, but an honest inquiry, and that is, it seems to be the way Jesus receives it. So he asked this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This might be one of the greatest existential questions of all time. Jesus talks a lot about salvation, God's deliverance from 
difficulties, especially present deliverance from present difficulties. And Jesus speaks a great deal about God's rule and reign entering into our world. He talks a lot about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and he's talking about God's rule and reign. So this expert wants a direct answer to the very direct spiritual question. And something happens uniquely in Luke's gospel. Jesus, instead of giving him the answer to the question that he asks, asks the question of the lawyer. What do you think? <laughs> I love this moment. Um, Christians so often are answer people where we ought to be people sometimes of good questions. Jesus often asks people questions and help them in a process of self-discovery that becomes part of God's revelation in their lives, which I just absolutely love. And so instead of giving him the answer, the way Matthew and Mark tell the story, this lawyer is asked the question, what does he think? And since the question is, what must one do to inherit eternal life? It's really significant that the lawyer gives an answer, not about ethical behavior, but about this central relationship that one is to have with Almighty God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, some have suggested that this is a basic Sunday school answer to the question, but instead of Jesus being the one who gives this bedrock answer, it's the lawyer. And now he's the one who gives this right answer, but also combines it with the broader answer that Jesus often teaches. It's not enough to say you love God. If you say you love God, you must also love your neighbor. These two laws now become one in the teaching of Jesus. And this lawyer has observed and listened to Jesus enough that it seems he's convinced on this point. Jesus commends his answer and simply adds, do this and you will live. <laughs> this lawyer seems to get that a relationship with God is what makes living a life of faith possible. Loving God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind is much more than a code of behavior. It's a spiritual relationship that affects all of our lives. If you don't recognize that this is a huge deal, you must have missed the German and the English and the Swiss and the Scandinavian reforms that take place in the 16th and early 17th centuries when this finally gains wider recognition, and it isn't until the end of the 20th century that the Roman Catholic Church actually affirms this teaching. This is really a big deal. But now to the heart of the scene. Luke's commentary states that the man went a step further and asked Jesus another question. And he asked this question in order to cast himself in the best light possible. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? This is a question that we all ask, right? Maybe not to justify ourselves, but we honestly would love to know to whom and how far is this obligation to be neighbor? Um, the general interpretation of the Hebrew scriptures in Jesus' day was that a neighbor was someone who was part of your own community. And it's interesting that the book of Leviticus goes so far in chapter 19 to say neighbor needs to be extended to even foreigners that reside within Israel. And so, boy, that's really kind of evocative. And it really is something that a lot of us are thinking about today when there's all these different feelings about immigrant populations and people who are different than maybe ourselves uh, having moved in and becoming part of our communities. Um, we've got to think about this much more deeply and talk about this much more than we have. But in, in Jesus' day, it was generally assumed that you were not required to extend this neighborliness to those outside of your community. But 
there's something else that we need to put together. And occasionally when you're trying to interpret scripture, it's really good to see that you're putting together the pieces of a puzzle. It's good to ask the question, has Jesus said anything about this previously? And if you look back just a couple chapters to Luke chapter six, you'll see Jesus teaching something that's really, really um, mind blowing, frankly. Here's what Jesus says in Luke 6, 27 to 36. But I say to you, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again, but love your enemies. Do good and lend and expect nothing in return. Your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. <laughs> These are not welcome words to someone who is trying to justify themselves. Instead, returning to the uncomfortable specificity of this teaching, Jesus tells a story, a parable, the type of story we've said really is intended to put a mirror up to our lives so that we see what's really going on, helps us to reflect and ask the very pointed question, Lord, what is it you're saying to me? What is it you're saying to us? And what would you have us do about it? So here's what Luke records. Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his road down that same was on his way down that same road. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levi religious man showed up, and he also avoided the injured man. A member of the Taliban traveling the road came upon him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill and I will pay you back. What do you think? Which of these three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? the one who treated him kindly, the religious scholar responded. Jesus said, go and do the same. I wonder today if you heard anything beyond when I said a member of the Taliban. I wonder if the lawyer heard anything Jesus said after he said along came a Samaritan. Jesus tells this story with the purposeful intention of choosing to make the hero of this story someone that the Jewish people absolutely hated as an enemy, who also was, by the way, a not too distant cousin. When I was in high school in the 60s, I remember my pastor preaching this um, text and he inserted a North Vietnamese soldier for the Samaritan. And I also remember how angry people walked out of church that morning. Without going into all the details about priests and Levites who would have been expected to render assistance to this Jewish neighbor of theirs who was hurt 
and left for half dead, they utterly failed. They tried to pretend like they didn't see the man, sort of like how we try to not make contact with that homeless person against the wall at the BART station or on the street in downtown Concord or wherever it is you live. Maybe if we don't look at them, we won't have to respond. The point of all this is that Jesus answers a very different question than the one the lawyer was asking. The lawyer was asking, how far am I obligated to go? Jesus answers the question, to whom shall I be a neighbor? And the answer very clearly is, to anyone who needs mercy. If God has invested in you financial resources adequate to meet all of your own needs and you still have some to spare, give it to someone for whom it could make a difference. The Samaritan paid for the lodging and care of this beat up Jewish man because he could and because he had compassion. This word compassion, suffering with someone, is used repeatedly in the Gospels to describe how Jesus feels uh, towards the people to whom he is doing ministry, people who are sick, people who are filled with evil, people who are uh, shunned by society. Pe Jesus consistently has compassion. We are called to be people of compassion. If God has invested in you a knowledge of first aid, oil to clean the wound, wine to disinfect it, go and do likewise. It's not always about money. You may have wisdom. You certainly have a life experience from the grace that God has placed in your life. Sharing wisdom is an excellent way to show mercy. Maybe God has invested in you the physical capability to actually lift somebody up and put them on your donkey, obviously, figuratively speaking, and get them to a place of care. Go and do likewise. If God has given you a great circle of friends, how are you encouraging your friends to be people of peace and people who show mercy? I have been ashamed of those moments when I've been with friends and we have looked at someone who clearly needed mercy and instead of giving them help, kind of made them into a object of derision. That's exactly the opposite of what Jesus is asking us to do. We need to be better about encouraging good and merciful behavior. And if you believe in a God who heals, a God who can work miracles, a God who can make a complete difference, especially in situations that seem totally impossible, then you can pray and you can speak words of encouragement and you can realize that you have way more spiritual capital than you could possibly imagine. It's time for God's rule and reign to be brought to bear in situations that desperately need mercy. You see, this is not about being a nice person. This is not a nice person message. This is an appeal for us to appreciate how much God has given to us and how much God has invested in us. And out of gratitude for all of that, how we with those amazing investments would show mercy to those who need it. Don't be one of those Christ followers who goes around saying, oh, God is good. God is good. But so infrequently shows how good God is by showing mercy to those who need to be seen and who need to be attended to and who could use a helping hand and who with the smallest investment in their recovery could actually recover, especially people who we cannot imagine repaying us. This is precisely what Jesus teaches us to do. Do this, Jesus says, and you will live. Love God, love your neighbor, go and do likewise. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, Forgive us for the ways in which we underestimate what you've done for us. We beat our chests and we confess that we are such sinners and the result is we miss the difference we can make in the lives of others. 
You have saved us, Lord, time and time and time again. Teach us to be as merciful to others as you have been to us. And allow us to hear the high calling. To begin each day with thanksgiving for all that you've done for us. And then as we head out into our day, help us to pray. Lord, to whom should I be a neighbor today on your behalf? We pray it in Jesus' name and for the sake of God's rule and reign in the world. Amen. My friends, thanks for joining us today. And uh, I pray this is a word that will encourage your heart to add to your spiritual disciplines. The simple question, Lord, to whom might I be a neighbor today? And that we respond in situations where we know mercy is required. And having known how deeply and how thoroughly God has shown mercy to us that we would extend it on. Thanks for tuning in and God bless you in your daily living.